The most basic part of the beginning chapter, which is kinematics, starts with position. This is just the location of an object. We usually use the variable x, and it's going to be measured in meters. The next quantity we could derive from that is velocity, which is how position changes over time. The units here will be meters per second. We're defining first an average velocity, which is the change in x over the change in time, or x final minus x initial over t final minus t initial. This only makes sense between two times. On the other hand, if we let that value of time head to zero, so rather than having a very long averaging interval, like looking at your position of 12 o'clock and then doing it again at 1 o'clock and finding your average velocity over that one hour, we can shorten that time down, down, using calculus we go to the limit as that time equals zero, the average velocity becomes the instantaneous velocity. We would write this as dx over dt using calculus. The slope of a position versus time graph is this velocity. And if we want to look at the position of a freely falling rock, which means there's no air resistance and it wasn't thrown, as a function of time, we can say first let's imagine we drop it from a height of 40 meters. Now we can go back and forth between x and y because right now we're just working in one dimensional motion so really everything should be x but very soon we're going to get into two dimensional problems and when we drop things we'll traditionally consider the up and down direction to be y. Anyway if we look at a plot of that the motion of this rock as a function of time we see that it takes just under three seconds to hit the ground and if we look at this first instant the slope of the line right here at the beginning is zero. So the velocity is zero when we start. If we look one second later at the same plot, here's the tangent point of the curve and the slope here is negative 9.8 meters per second. After two seconds, down here the slope is now negative 19.6 meters per second. We could follow that all the way down calculating the instantaneous velocity by finding the slope. On the other hand, if we throw a rock straight up from the ground with an initial velocity of 30 meters per second, what will that path look like? Well, we see here, this is the path, this parabola. This is the general path for x as a function of time if we're throwing something up in the air. The position at x equals one, at, sorry, t equals 1, here's the position, the velocity is shown here, it's 20.2 meters per second since we started at 30 and we lose 9.8 meters per second every second. If we go to the top, the velocity is now zero. You can tell the slope is zero here. The line is flat. This is the highest point we'll reach because the velocity is zero here. On the way back down, if we look after about five seconds, at this point the velocity is negative 19 meters per second because we're doing 30 minus 5 times g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. The next kinematically interesting quantity is acceleration. The units of this are meters per second per second or meters per second squared. Here our average acceleration is delta v over delta t or vf minus v initial over t final minus t initial. If we take the limit where the delta t goes to zero, the average acceleration becomes the instantaneous acceleration. This is just the time derivative of velocity or the second time derivative of position. If we plot velocity versus time for a drop from 40 meters to the ground, we get this line starting at zero velocity and ending at about negative 30 meters per second. And if you look, the slope of this is the same everywhere. We have a slope of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. If we instead look at the plot of velocity versus time for throwing a rock straight up with a speed of 30 meters per second initially. We get this line. Notice it has the same slope as before because we still have the same acceleration as before, negative 9.8 meters per second squared, the entire time, beginning at the top where velocity is zero and at the end. This straight line means a constant slope or a constant acceleration. If we plot acceleration versus time for a free fall problem, where we always get negative 9.8 meters per second squared, we get this very simple graph of a straight line. If we look at the area, 
of the region between this acceleration line and the time axis, we get something that looks like this. To find this area, we would take the integral. And if we take the integral with respect to time of A, we get velocity as a function of time. Since we have constant acceleration, this is a very simple integral. We get just negative 9.8 times t. However, there's a piece missing. You know that whenever you do an integral, a definite integral, you should end up with an additive constant. This has to have the same units as a times t, and those units are velocity. So this constant is actually the initial velocity. You might see this written as v0 or vi, depending on the source you're looking at. Therefore, for constant acceleration, we get our first kinematic equation, vf equals v0 plus at. You might see vf, you might just see v, you might see v parentheses t, since it's a really a function of t. Now, we could still find the velocity if we had a non-constant acceleration, but the integral here would just be a little bit more complicated. Instead of just being a linear function of time, it would be quadratic or cubic or something higher or something non-polynomial. We can compare the plot of area under the acceleration curve and velocity as a function of time below. If we look here, this has the acceleration curve, which is the top one that has the filled in area, and the velocity curve, the lower one with the pink square, for a rock thrown straight up from the ground at 30 meters per second. Our starting velocity, v0, is again that constant c in the integral. At one second, we have an orange area which is negative 9.8 meters per second squared times one second. Our velocity is then reduced from 30 by 9.8 meters per second. We can then go on to 2 seconds, 3 seconds, 4, 5, 6, and we see as this area increases and is negative, the V, which is the sum of that area, gets more negative as well. We find our next kinematic equation by integrating the one for velocity as a function of acceleration and time. When we do that, if we do the integral with respect to time, we get x as a function of time, which is, of course, position. We can rewrite this v as at plus v naught. And again, we're assuming the acceleration is a constant. But we have both integral terms here. If the acceleration is a constant, it comes outside the integral. And we get 1 half at squared. Then we get v naught times time from this piece. And of course, we get a constant of integration. This has to have the same units of velocity times time or acceleration times time squared, which is position, so that makes sense. This is our initial position, and we can write it as x naught or xi, again, depending on the book. That means this is our second kinematic equation. This is the longest one. Instead of xf, you may see just a plain x, or you may see the form x as a function of time, since it is. We could have a non-constant acceleration. We could go through all this, and we would just get a more involved integration here and a different expression here. But for practically everything we do, we'll use constant acceleration. It's important to keep in mind the kinematic equations, and we're going to end up with three of them when it's all over, they depend on constant acceleration. So if you have a case where that's not true, you can't use them. We can get our third kinematic equation by looking at the first one and breaking it up like this. Now we have this in the form of an expression for time, and we can plug this expression for time into this kinematic equation for t squared and for t. And if we do that, we get something like this, and we can move our way through the algebra here. And what we end up with is the third and last kinematic equation that says that the final velocity squared is the initial velocity squared plus 2a times the difference in final and initial positions, sometimes called delta x. This is our third one, and you'll find that you can solve practically any problem with constant acceleration 